During the later years of the 2000s, SpongeBob Flash games were seeing a considerable rise in quality. With Sarbakken leading the charge, we were met with many memorable releases. When 2008 came around, giving us specials such as Whatever Happened to SpongeBob and Pest of the West, the Flash games continued to flourish. Sarbakken, This Is Pop, and Smashing Ideas were unstoppable. So let's check out the SpongeBob games on Nick.com that came out in 2008. To start off, here's one many of us used to play. Slam and Sluggers is a baseball game where you control a few characters and try to beat the other team. And even though they change it up from time to time, it's easy to recognize a Sarbakken game from this art style. So according to this, we're in a match between Team Bikini and Team Anchovy. Ah yes, the age-old rivalry. To start, you select your batting order between SpongeBob, Patrick, and Sandy. SpongeBob pitches no matter what though. Then we're thrown into the stadium and the game commences. You choose a ball from one of three options, then you click a rising meter at the right time to set the power of your throw. Then you click again at just the right moment to determine the effectiveness of it. Then SpongeBob throws it and the opponent tries to hit it. The cheesy curveball and patty fastball are guaranteed misses for them, but you can only use them twice. It's three strikes and Team Anchovy is out. Then you move on to the batting segment, which has the same controls. I like this because you can destroy the whole stadium. It's okay, you can avoid charges for destruction of property by saying it was all in the spirit of baseball. And whoa, Sandy looks like she means business. Hey, calm down there, squirrel. Damage to equipment isn't covered by the spirit of baseball. Now this is very similar to another game on Nick.com called Backyard Smash Ball, a Jimmy Neutron game. It has almost the exact same mechanics. They're both a lot of fun, but they do go on for a while. You have to be really precise and play it a few times to really get the hang of the system. No good baseball player ever got that way overnight. But yeah, the animation has a nice charm to it, and I like how they put so much detail into everything's design. Not to mention all the damage you can do. For example, look how they use part of the Krusty Krab here. I like when games take every opportunity they can to include parts of the show they're based on. These details don't go unnoticed and can really set the scene. I mean, not that I'd mind watching Spongebob play a realistic game of baseball, but still. This is really popular, and I completely understand how you can end up playing it for hours. And I like that games like this exist, because it's the only time you'll see me trying to hit a baseball without making a fool of myself. This is a classic, and one I'm sure many of us still enjoy. I'm glad to give it a swing once again. But let's move on, because Sarbakken had a lot more for us this year, including one that many would consider one of the single most memorable cartoon Flash games of all time. But it's also one that has suffered a terrible fate as time has gone by. I've talked about it on several different occasions, but now that we're in 2008, it's time to elaborate a little. This is Invasion of the Lava King. It was a shockingly massive game that was split into three episodes. It's an overhead-styled adventure where you control Spongebob and go on a quest to defeat this villain called the Lava King. Fun as it is, everything feels a little distant from the actual show. For example, Patrick doesn't even seem to talk to you like you're his actual best friend. He talks like he's a quest giver talking to some adventurer. Jeez, Patrick, I thought we were closer than that. But that's because he gives you your first weapon, a spatula, and teaches you the controls. You go around fighting enemies like jellyfish and exploring caves. Right off the bat, you have many options for different places to explore. You can even find your friends and help them out. Mr. Krabs even has a shop you can buy stuff from with the in-game currency. You can collect it by destroying everything in sight. You can also find keys to unlock doors and explore deeper into dungeons. You also have two weapon slots you can use the A and S keys to activate. You're gonna need all the help you can get as far as weapons go. Later enemies like these eels are extremely hard to fight. Once you run out of Krabby Patties, you die and have to continue at your last save point. Now here's the kicker. If you play this game today, dying is a legitimate death sentence. If at any point you open the menu or try to save, the game will completely bug out. This includes when the menu opens automatically after you die. There are only three spots in the entire game where saving doesn't destroy your progress. And even when I try to play through it without opening the menu or dying, I still struggle because instances like this will open the menu even if I don't do it myself. The reason for these complications is because the programming was faulty from the beginning. As Flash updated over time, it lost the ability to run smoothly. Now it's almost impossible to find a working version of this. Thankfully, it doesn't seem to be a lost cause. There have been efforts to reprogram the game to take out the bugs that lead to the glitches. With how many fans this has, there are a lot of people who want to see it revived. And with how big, detailed, and expansive this is, I definitely plan to cover it on its own in a future video. But for now, many of us can cherish the memories we have of playing this highly ambitious Spongebob Flash game. We still have quite a few to get through this year, but we'll meet again, Lava King. Mark my words.
Now, there were a few big SpongeBob specials that came out in 2008. One was Pest of the West, which was a massive deal at the time. SpongeBob as a cowboy? Of course it's gonna be big. This received a Flash game called Pest of the West Showdown, which we've actually looked at before, specifically in my last video. But to summarize, this was a WarioWare-inspired compilation of cowboy-themed mini-games. They didn't miss the opportunity to include as many cowboy-related features as they could. Most of them require you to shake the mouse or rapidly click. You go through each of them in a loop until you run out of lives. They get faster each time you cycle through them. One of the most unique micro-games is this one where you have to shake milkshakes. This is weird because you can only briefly shake them because if you shake for too long, you get covered in the shake but it's fun to keep sliding them once you get the hang of how long you need to shake for. I also like this one where you have to shoot a hat to keep it in the air, but it falls really quickly, so you have to be lightning quick if you even want to try. I even discovered this glitch where it just stays in the air. I enjoy shooting the bottles while it does this. In case you didn't realize it from our baseball match, I love causing damage. I have many serious problems. Now, in my opinion, this game really needs more than seven micro-games. It can be a time killer, but not all of these have the most involved mechanics. For example, the slot machine one kind of just comes down to luck and can be really annoying. And the one where you're tied to tracks is really easy because all you really do is swing the mouse back and forth a few times. And this one where you have to lasso a seahorse is far too easy. I couldn't even fail the faster stages when I was deliberately trying to. What, I needed footage of someone failing it for a skit. But again, it isn't bad, it just needed more than seven minigames in my opinion. This was similar to another game Sarbakken released this year called Super Stuffed Nicktoons Minigame Mania 2, which was a sequel to the first. It was a compilation of microgames from a few different Nicktoons rather than just Spongebob. Most of them were the same as in the first though. Hey, what do you mean learn to cook? I don't need this sass from you, even though it's true. But let's keep going. Here's Dirty Bubble Busters. This was made as part of Nickelodeon's Big Green Help event. This was a whole program the channel put together to encourage kids to help the environment, and this game sure encourages it. The whole premise is that you have to pick up garbage and fight the dirty bubble, who's dirtying things up. You find trash in dirty bubbles to suck them into your Ghostbuster-style vacuum. Love the hairpiece, by the way. A good solution to sponge pattern baldness. You also have to help civilians that are being dirty bubbled into zombies. They throw trash balls at you. It's like a SpongeBob version of Half-Life 2, except the people are cured when you take the face huggers off. You can even find yourself being dirty bubbled. Then you switch to Patrick. You switch characters whenever you die. This one's pretty fun, though the stages go on for a while and it can feel repetitive sometimes. But it's a testament to how much patience is required when trying to help the environment in real life. If you've ever worked as a custodian, you know just how little people care about trash, so cleaning it really does take a lot of patience. As a side note, one of my favorite things you can do in this game is bounce backwards. Whee! <laughs> and one other interesting part of this is the code you can enter. Guess what the code is? Walmart. This unlocks a small minigame. So again, this is a good one. Maybe playing it will really encourage you to go out and make a difference in the world. Or it'll motivate you to angrily burst every bubble you see. I mean, what's the worst that can happen if a game encourages people to hate bubbles? And that brings us to Who Bob What Pants. In October of 2008, a special SpongeBob episode called Whatever Happened to SpongeBob came out. It was advertised as Who Bob What Pants and received its own game on Nick.com. It involves SpongeBob developing amnesia and running off to New Kelp City. There, he's an outcast because he blows bubbles, which aggravates a group called the Bubble Poppin' Boys. So in this SpongeBob version of Bubble Bobble, you have to fight them. You jump around on platforms and blow bubbles to encapsulate them. Then you jump into the bubbles to murder them and make them drop items. If you collect two halves of a heart, everyone gets bubbled. At least they aren't dirty this time. I imagine being inside the dirty bubble would be like being under sewage water. But you have to be extremely careful when going through this. You only have seven lives and you can't collect any new ones, so taking damage is very nerve-wracking. The later stages can get really hard because of this. It's also a little unfair that enemies can drop in from above and land directly on top of you, giving you no time to react. The best strategy is to just repeatedly bubble as enemies approach. That usually works out. But again, this is really difficult. But I enjoy it, and Bubble Bobble was one of my favorite arcade games growing up. I just wish they gave you the chance to collect more lives. I can't beat it because I can rarely make it to the last few stages with any more than one. But for a neat little detail, the time of day changes in the background with every stage. It shows the time passing as you're fighting the Battle of Bubbles. You even fight well into the next day. 
this is a very serious war. As these past few games have taught us, bubbles are a legitimate weapon of destruction. The Bubble Poppin' boys were right. These things bring death and mayhem wherever they go. Ah! And finally, the other two games Sarbakim released in 2008 were online versions of Spongebob board games made for the Nick Arcade. These were the Game of Life and Monopoly. I always used to love the Spongebob-themed board games in real life. The Nick Arcade versions are much harder, but a lot of fun. Just as long as you have friends to play them with. Oh. Well, this one is like the typical Game of Life, you can activate a mode with additional mini-games. I really like the detail at the left of the screen where you see your character changing as you unlock certain stuff. The mini-games can get a little frustrating to deal with, so I don't blame people who choose to go with the traditional format. But I respect the system in place, because certain jobs will give you advantages in different ones. Though I do feel like some of the mini-games don't explain the rules very clearly, making it hard to figure out what you're supposed to do on the spot. Some of these took me a while to figure out. Back when I first touched on this game, I still didn't understand how the mailbox mini-game worked. But this is a fun party game to spruce up the usual Game of Life experience. Monopoly is good too, but I didn't enjoy the mini-games as much. It seemed like most of them were just mashing a button the entire time. Though you can enter a secret code and unlock King David Bowie from Atlantis Square Pantis. That's fun. Like with the Game of Life, you can go with the traditional rules, but you also have a few extra modes to choose from. One where you can move anyone's token, and one where you have to get the most money before Plankton completes a lap around the board. But as can be expected from Monopoly, the screen is a little overwhelming with how many options you have. Just understand the rules of Monopoly and you should be fine. Mostly. I also have to mention how comical it can be whenever you get sent to jail. <laughs> But even though most of the minigames just require you to smash a button, some of them are really creative. And it's nice to see the animation, too. It emulates using an actual board really well. I especially like being able to shake the dice and throw them across the board. These are both fair alternatives to playing the physical board games, but I wish you luck with finding three other people who will cram together in front of the computer with you to play them. My friends abandoned me after I asked them to. But that's gonna do it for Sarbakin in 2008. They released some memorable stuff, perhaps some of the biggest classics in the whole of Spongebob web games, but they weren't the only company with good releases this year. Smashing Ideas was also still around, aka one of the first companies to make any Spongebob games. So let's see how they were doing. This is Invasion of the Patty Snatchers. Now if I had a nickel for every time Spongebob had a game title that parodied Invasion of the Body Snatchers but used the word patty instead of body, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird it happened twice. This is a tower defense game that came out long before Nick Kingdoms. It isn't super involved, but it's interesting enough. Just check out these fish. Look at this guy. Horror! Plankton has created a robotic army. Eh, we've dealt with them before. So Plankton's created an army of robots and they're headed for the Krusty Krab. Now it's time to defend. Plankton marches in as we choose either easy, medium, or hard mode. Yeah, some of the letters don't load in this for some reason. So we have four options we can defend ourselves with, but you have to buy them. You have a budget at the top of the screen and you can sell weapons to regain money. You can even upgrade them for a cost. You choose your weapons, drag them somewhere on a map, then watch them take down Plankton's hoard. You have to be smart about spending because it's easy to put all your cash into the wrong investments, just like real life. But it isn't the most detailed game, so you can have as many tries as you desire to get it right. It's a basic tower defense game. Not too many options to choose from, but it scratches the itch tower defense players may incur when they go too long without playing one. Ironically, even if it isn't as involved, I think this is actually harder than Nick Kingdoms. Never put me in charge of defending anything. That's our lesson here. But aside from this, Smashing Ideas released another simple game this year. It was called Spitwad Showdown. Ugh, that sounds nasty. SpongeBob and Patrick are having a duel with spitwads. They're hanging on really long ropes between these trees and shooting at each other. You control SpongeBob and have to hit Patrick more than he can hit you. You move up and down while avoiding jellyfish and other obstacles. You have to navigate your spitwads around them. Down below, Squidward is using his reef blower to shoot up various objects at you. You can get creative with how you navigate the spitwads through these obstacles. I like watching them bounce around. And look how stunned Patrick is whenever he loses a round. He really didn't expect that. Or he's just horrified by the victory dance SpongeBob is doing over here. Way to rub it in. 
But as per usual, the Smashing Ideas games weren't too complicated. They had a simple yet decent style for most of the stuff they made. They're nice little activities to occupy time with. It's hard not to like them. But on the flip side, one other company would release some of its most impressive creations this year. To close out, let's see the two games This Is Pop had to show us. As a company that knew a thing or two about cartoon Flash games, it's no surprise that their developments were so high quality. So let's start with one called Spongebob Saves Bikini Bottom. Our old nemesis Doodle Bob is the antagonist this time. He's found another magic pencil and he's drawing evil doodles to attack the city. Oh no, I don't think I could handle fighting evil doodles. But this game has a creative style because of the sketchbook nature to it. It's a good detail and really makes it stand out from all the other games. You fly around as Spongebob and shoot the enemy doodles, mostly planktons and jellyfish. You're shooting them with erasers, though because of the perspective, it can be a little difficult to tell if your aim was specific enough to hit its target. This actually works in your favor, because when Doodle Bob shows up and shoots pencils at you, they're easy to avoid. Wow, I just got impaled by a freaking pencil. I am no talent. Okay, that's funny. A Spongebob game that calls you talentless for losing. No need to remind me. Anyway, this is a lot of fun, and I really like it. It's no Doodle Bob and the Magic Pencil, but pretty good. But the especially big game to come out this year was their other project. This one had actually been in the works for a while. It was based on the episode Atlantis Square Pantis, which aired in 2007, but the quality of this made it worth the wait. This was Atlantis Square Pantis Square Off, an extended version of their earlier work Square Off, which came out in 2005. It was only ever released on their personal website, though. It's a much bigger version of that game, where you move Spongebob through a series of maps and utilize cards to battle enemies with different moves. The story is different from the episode, but it really works to drive you through the gameplay. Plankton has raised an army and taken over Atlantis. He had to get a new one because we destroyed his last one in the tower defense game. So Mr. Krabs gives Spongebob and Patrick a magic chest filled with cards they can fight with. There's dialogue all throughout the game, and some of it can be really witty, though it can be weird at times. So you begin your adventure by moving or attacking with a deck of cards. They use up a certain amount of energy, so you have to use them wisely. Some cards also go away forever once you use them, so you better save them for when you really need them. When you gain these cards, you also have to keep track of how much damage they do and how much energy they expend. Some of the same attacks can have different stats. This isn't a game you can just start up and play casually. It requires a lot of thought and strategizing. It's all about working your cards to match the playing field. You even have belts that can change your stats around, so it's a highly complicated system. But in stages, you can collect coins and use them to play Bubble Buddy's card game. This has the chance to give you an especially good card, but it isn't necessary. But as far as graphics go, I love the way everything looks and moves. It's very well animated. The music is also brilliant. I also like how they included as many characters from the show as they could. This feels like a big love letter to Spongebob, making use of every part of the show they could fit in. Even Doodle Bob's back. I guess we need to get our eraser shooter again. Even locations from the show that weren't in the episode are here. You fight a boss at the end of each location, and while they are challenging, it all comes down to how you strategize and choose to use your cards. Both the bosses and the regular enemies become increasingly harder to fight as you move farther along. Eventually, all the bosses team up and come at you at the same time. At first, you can just go around them and win by reaching the goal, but the final stage might be one of the hardest levels I've ever had to struggle through. You fight all of your toughest opponents and have to distance them perfectly to fight them one-on-one -on -one so they don't overwhelm you. They really want you to work for that victory. Check out how it went last time we covered this. Here's what I did. I worked on leading every individual fighter away, then I attacked with my strongest cards while using my best shield every round. This worked out for me and I was able to make my way to the Dastardly Trio. Being very careful with every move I made, I took out the dirty bubble and- Wait, wait, I didn't know we had that ra- <laughs> The worst thing about it is that you can get pretty far, but then lose, and not only do you have to do it again, but you have to go back through earlier stages to farm for any one-use-only cards you lost during it. It's a long fight that requires a ton of planning. 
and potential farming. Your two best friends will be patience and constant shielding. You have to keep your distance and know the range your enemies can attack in. Only by mastering the arts of fleeing, shielding, and maintaining distance will you be able to beat this nearly impossible fight. Then you win the game. And what an astounding game it is. Who would have thought an online Spongebob game could have such a complicated system that rivals its own console games? It's very well made and by far one of the most enjoyable Spongebob web games. Sure, it's highly difficult, but it's worth playing and extremely satisfying to complete. This was certainly a highlight in Spongebob's gaming history, and one I can't recommend enough. It contributed to making this an essential year for Spongebob web games. But again, it didn't do it alone. Invasion of the Lava King, Slammin' Slugger, Spongebob Saves Bikini Bottom, and all the others did their part too. All of these were great to grow up with, and a great way to spend your time when you weren't at school or doing homework. It's hard not to enjoy yourself when revisiting these old classics. The works of Sarbakan, This Is Pop, and Smashing Ideas are forever etched onto Spongebob's wall of history, and the Flash games of the series would only continue to prosper as time went on. 2008 gave us a lot of good ones, but 2009 would continue to keep up the momentum. But for now, we'll have to wait and see how they did next time. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.